Assalamu alaikum wa My name is John Fontaine. Welcome back to another, ep another episode of Judaism and Christianity in the Light of Islam. In the previous show, we were discussing the lengthy hadith regarding Abu Sufyan's interaction with the king of the Roman Empire, Heraclius. SubhanAllah, this was in a time before Abu Sufyan became a Muslim. He was actually uh, trading in Sham and the king actually called him uh, for discussion. As we discussed last time, the king questioned Abu Sufyan in a lengthy hadith, subhanAllah, which narrated the lengthy discussion which they had uh, together, where the king was asking about this man from Arabia who claims to be a prophet. He asked him about his morals, his etiquettes, his family lineage, uh, what type of people follow him, and subhanAllah, all of these questions which were answered by Abu Sufyan uh, actually made the king conclude that the man, that the Prophet, peace be upon him, was a Prophet of Allah. And to the extent that the king actually said, if what you're saying is true, this man, this Prophet, this man who's claiming to be a Prophet, will actually rule and take over this land under my feet, subhanAllah. And of course, Heraclius knew this uh, because of the previous scriptures. The scripture that Heraclius had, he concluded from his book, which he was using, that there was going to be a prophet to come and this prophet would actually conquer the land of Sham, which is modern day Syria and uh, Palestine, etc. So during this interaction with Abu Sufyan, uh, one, a letter was actually brought forward from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And we're going to discuss this letter today. So this is a letter which was sent from the Prophet Muhammad to Heraclius. It says, In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, this letter is from Muhammad, the slave of Allah and his apostle, to, who, to Heraclius, the ruler of Byzantine, which is the eastern part of the Roman Empire. Peace be upon him who follows the right path. Furthermore, I invite you to Islam. And if you become a Muslim, you will be safe. And Allah will double your reward. And if you reject this invitation to Islam, you will be committing a sin by misguiding the Arisiyin. And then the Prophet in the, in the, in the, in the letter, he recites the ayah, O people of the book, Come to a word common to you and us that we worship none but Allah and that we associate nothing in worship with him and that none of us shall take others as lords beside Allah. Then if they turn away, say, bear witness that we are Muslims, those who have surrendered to Allah. Now in this letter, it's a very detailed letter to the Prophet from the Prophet where he's inviting the king to Islam. He's saying that he should accept Islam. If a Christian, of course, accepts Islam, they will be given double reward. Also, he's also reminding them of the implications if he rejects Islam, that he will actually become uh, responsible and he will be the one who is responsible for misguiding the Arisiyin. Now, who are the Arisiyin? Some of the scholars have disagreed upon what this means. Uh, most of the scholars say this, this is speaking about the poor people who he was ruling upon or the subjects within his state. But Arisiyin could also possibly be referring to the Aryans. As we mentioned last time, uh, there was a type of Christianity called the Aryans and they actually believed in one God. They didn't believe in the Trinity. And in fact, this type of Christianity was prom prominent in parts of Europe and also parts of the Roman Empire, specifically uh, the, the uh, eastern part of the Roman Empire at the time of the Prophet. So the Prophet Sallallahu he's telling the king, look, if you don't accept Islam, if you don't allow the subjects within your state to hear the message of Islam, you're going to be responsible for their misguidance. So after this letter was actually narrated, to Heraclius, uh, Abu Sufyan actually told us that when Heraclius had finished his speech and had read the letter, there was a great hue and cry in the royal court. So he was actually turned out of the court. 
and he was told um, by his companions um, uh, that the Prophet, uh, subhanAllah, that he was actually shocked. Heraclius was very shocked that this Prophet had came from the Arabs. He, didn't, he knew that there was going to be a Prophet, but he didn't know that he would be from the Arabs. Then he started, and Abu Sufyan actually said that when this happened, he was actually sure this is one of the one of the steps which actually led Abu Sufyan to come into the truth because he said he was sure that the Prophet Muhammad was going to actually conquer Syria. SubhanAllah, there's actually an addition to this hadith which has been narrated, um, which actually speaks about um, Heraclius when he was in Jerusalem. He actually traveled to Jerusalem and Heraclius said that he actually used to do magic. He used to read stars. So he would look into the sky and read the stars. This is a type of sihr, a type of uh, horoscope reading, if you like. And he actually concluded from his sihr, from his magic, that there would be a prophet to come who would be circumcised. And so Heraclius, again, he started to check whether the Arabs would be circumcised or not and he was again was shocked that the Arabs were actually uh, a circumcised people or the Muslims we should say subhanallah so in this lengthy hadith subhanallah Abu Sufyan before he was a Muslim was questioned by uh, the king of, of the Roman Empire Heraclius he questioned him in detail about who the prophet was what did he claim to be what was his family lineage and all the answers that Abu Sufyan replied led the king, led the Heraclius to accept this is a prophet and if I meet him, I will kiss his feet, subhanAllah. He also read the letter of the prophet which was addressed to him, which was a direct invitation to him, ordering him to accept Islam and showing him the implications, the rewards of accepting Islam, that he will be protected under Islam. He will be given double the reward and also speaking about the warning if you don't accept Islam, the implications that you as a king are going to be responsible for the misguidance of your subjects. SubhanAllah, Abu, this was also a very important hadith because it actually led Abu Sufyan to be a Muslim. He, he seen an external source from the Arabs, kings uh, from outside of Arabia, powerful kings who actually knew about this prophet to come knew the description in detail to the extent that the king became very agitated and he was screaming in his palace subhanallah and this is a very important hadith to know that people at the time of the prophet some of the people of the book not all of them but some of them some of the jews some of the christians they were waiting upon a prophet there were other christians as well such as the negus of abyssinia the king of Abyssinia, who was living in Ethiopia at the time, the king of, the, of Ethiopia, he was also another king who acknowledged the prophet peace be upon him. But the difference between the Negus is the Negus did accept Islam. And we know this because the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he told us that Jibreel told him about the day that the Negus passed away. And what did the prophet peace be upon him do? He prayed Janaza on the king of Abyssinia. So from this we, we can conclude that the Negus did accept Islam, but as far as we know, Heraclius, the king of the Romans, he didn't accept Islam, although he did know and, and know the signs of prophethood. What's interesting with the Negus, the king of Ethiopia, is this was the first place of Hijra. At the time in Mecca, when the Muslims were being persecuted at the very beginning of the message, some of the Muslims, they didn't have the protection of the, their tribal protection. They didn't have the protection of their tribes or they were not wealthy. They were being persecuted and beaten and some of them were even killed. To the extent that it became so difficult that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he allowed and advised some of them to actually travel all the way to Africa. And I've actually visited uh, Ethiopia. I've been to the area in Ethiopia of Abyssinia where uh, Heraclius was ruling and subhanAllah is such a difficult journey coming from Arabia crossing the sea 
uh, traveling throughout Africa to get to the area of the king. But the Prophet, peace be upon him, advised some of the Sahaba, go to Abyssinia where there is a just king, a just Christian king, and he will allow you to stay. And as we know the story of uh, Ethiopia and story of the Hijra, this king allowed the Muslims to live within his empire, even though the, Ara the Arabs, the, the pagans at the time, they came to the king, they offered him gifts, they tried to bribe the king in to give the Muslims back so that they could persecute them even more. But the king refused the gifts. He refused the gifts and said, no, these Muslims can stay within my empire. And of course, there was a lengthy discussion at this time where the Muslims were presenting the Islamic perspective of the belief in Isa alayhi uh, salam and they actually recited Surah Maryam, parts of Surah Maryam where it speaks about the story of Isa saying that he is a subhanAllah, a prophet of Allah, a messenger of Allah, someone who was uh, sent by God rather than someone who is God or the son of God. So this is a, a very uh, important thing when we look at the interactions uh, at the time of the Prophet وسلم, with the other nations like uh, the kings of the Roman Empire, uh, Heraclius and also the kings of Abyssinia. Two different examples, one of them didn't accept and one of them did accept Islam. Alhamdulillah. It's very interesting, we get a holistic understanding of the interactions of the Prophet with uh, the people of the book. That's all we have time for today. Join me next time for another episode of Judaism and, and Christianity in the light of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.